Today our message could be entitled the unifying factor or it could be daring to bridge the gap. You will decide. Either the unifying factor or daring to bridge the gap. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful that we can come together from many different perspectives, recognizing that your word speaks to us and it says the same thing. Today, Lord, we ask that you will touch our hearts and ears and make them into receptive vessels. And today, Lord, my prayer is still the same, that no trace of I be found. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Born in Sacramento, California, on April the 2nd, 1965, Rodney King was caught by the Los Angeles police after a high-speed chase on March the 3rd, 1991. The officers pulled him out of the car and beat him brutally whilst an amateur cameraman, George Halliday, caught it all on video. The four LAPD officers involved were indicted on charges of assault with a deadly weapon and excessive use of force by a police officer. However, after a three-month trial, a predominantly white jury acquitted the officers, inflaming citizens and sparking the violent 1992 Los Angeles riots. More than 50 people were killed. More than 2,000 were injured and 9,500 were arrested for rioting, looting and arson, resulting in over $1 billion in property damage. On the third day of the riots, Rodney King made a public appearance, making his now famous plea, people, I just want to say, can we all get along? Can we all get along? What a question. What a question. Maybe we also need this question. Can we all get along? You see, there is so much that seems to separate us and so much that leaves us separated. And for a moment, just consider your context, your circumstance, your environment, and ask yourself, what is it that separates? Is it education? Is it position? Is it class? Is it status? Is it age? Is it color? What is it that separates? Is it gender? Is it style? Is it fashion? Ask yourself, what is it that separates? Is it language? Is it place of birth? Is it our domestic status? What is it that separates? Is it our youthfulness? Is it our seniority? Is it our life experience? What is it that separates? Is it our dietary preferences? Is it that we prefer ackee and saltfish? Or flying fish and cuckoo? Is it that we prefer roti and curry goat? Is it that we prefer fish, chips and mushy peas? Is it that we prefer turkey and pumpkin pie, or sadza, or bobiti, or matoki and luwombo, saltfish, breadfruit, 
and coconut dumplings or that we prefer fungi and pepper pots? What is it that separates? Is it our mother tongue that we speak Shona or the Bailey or the Queen's English? or one of the many other languages that's represented here, or even that we speak patois. <laughs> Separation is a terrible thing, and its consequences are far-reaching, even in the church. For separation, it leads to factions and friction. A separation leads to misunderstanding and misrepresentation. A separation leads to tensions and trepidation. A separation leads to discontent and disunity. But what is it that causes us to enter into this state of separation? You know, in the 1800s, there was just two deacons in a small Baptist church in Mayfield County, Kentucky. And the two deacons, they hated each other and were always opposed to one another. And on a particular Sunday morning, one deacon put up a small wooden peg into the back wall so that the minister could hang his hat. And when the other deacon discovered the peg, he was outraged that he had not been consulted. And the church took sides, and eventually the church split, and the departing group formed a new church called the Anti-Peg Baptist Church. One more time, I raise the question, what is it that separates us? You know, we are a people of the book, and we believe the word, and we acknowledge the psalmist who says in Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But we have to accept the old adage states that birds of a feather they flock together. And though we are under the banner and the blood of Jesus Christ, and though we declare that we are one in the Father and the Son, still we have to agree. We have our peculiarities and our eccentricities and our idiosyncrasies and our own God-given God uniqueness. And I still wonder what is it that separates? You know, one vivid picture of separateness and separate resolution can be seen in the book of Genesis. In fact, if we take a few moments and we reflect over Genesis chapter 13, 1 to 8, Genesis chapter 13, 1 to 8. A familiar uh, story there. Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. And there we read in Genesis 13, 1 to 8, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had and lot with him into the south, and Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginnings between Bethel and Hay, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called unto the name of the Lord, and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. The Bible says, and there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle 
and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. And then in verse 9, Abraham highlights, Is not the whole land before thee? Imagine, they are marking their territory. They are fussing about land. There is so much of it before them, and they are squaring up and becoming contentious. The situation is so volatile that at any moment, full-scale war will be declared. But the situation is diffused, and cool, calm, and collected Abram steps up to Lot. And in amorous tones, he states, let there be no strife between me and thee. Uh, let us not quarrel. And the reason he gives is we are brethren. O oh, Lot, let there be no strife between us. Uh, there's a bond between us. There's a tie so valuable something worth saving, something worth keeping. We are brethren. You know, we are church folk. And we are no different from Abraham and Lot. If the truth be known, we have our uh, frictions and uh, we have our disputes. We have our little rumblings. And yes, we get a little heated sometimes and we become vocal. And, and let's be honest, sometimes things get a little volatile. But just think, if we had more people in the church like Abraham, who would just place their arm around your shoulder and counsel, let no strife be between me and thee, for we are brethren, how different things would be if we had someone just to remind us there's a bond between us there's a tie that is so valuable something worth saving something worth keeping we are brethren you know the wise man is not wrong when he says in proverbs 15 verse 1 a soft answer turneth away wrath. But friends, what is it that separates us? Uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but the thing which I believe that separates us the most is self. Uh, we have a, a high, high and haughty opinion of ourselves. I mean, people talk about Jamaica. And when you listen, they sound as though there is no other place in the world. Or you hear people talking about Zimbabwe as though there is no one else. Or you hear people talking about the USA like there's nowhere else. Or you hear people talking about England as though it is the place or you hear just a few people talking about Nevis, reminding everybody that it's so beautiful that the Garden of Eden must have been there. Yes, we have a high and haughty opinion of ourselves. Uh, we just raise up and have this haughty opinion of ourselves. I don't know, you probably heard the story of the big mean liar. And this lion met a monkey in the jungle and all of a sudden the lion just pounced on the poor monkey and said, who is the king of the jungle? And the frightened monkey replied, you are, almighty oh lion, you are. And so the lion let him go. And the lion then met a zebra 
as he wandered through the jungle and all of a sudden he pounced on the zebra and roared, who is the king of the jungle? And the zebra said, well, you are, O oh mighty lion, you are. And so the lion let him go. And as the lion continued through the jungle, he met an elephant and he pounced on the elephant and roared, who is the king of the jungle? And the elephant grabbed the lion, twirled him around in the air and threw him 50 yards. And the poor lion picked himself up and huffed. Just because you don't know the answer is no need for you to get rough. <laughs> Just like that lion, we allow ourselves to become high and lifted up. And our self-problem causes separation. And I believe we need to come to the understanding, not I, but Christ, be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ, in every look and action. Not I, but Christ, in every thought and word. You know, the truth of the matter is how we deal with self will make all the difference to this separation business. Remember one lady in one of the churches I pastored, she used to be heard singing, let me lose my life and find it, Lord, in thee. May all self be slain, my friends see only thee. Though it costs me grief and pain, I will find my life again. If I lose my life, I'll find it, Lord, in thee. We need to slay self. We need to deal with the big issue of self. For it is self-exaltation that causes separation amongst us. How much are we concerned about each other? How much do we really care about each other? In fact, how far are we willing to go in order to reach out to one another? How many of us dare venture out to bridge the gap of separation? You know, it's impossible to talk about bridging the gap without talking about the children of Israel and Moses. You see, the children of Israel were just like church people. When things were good, they were good. But when things were not going so well, they certainly acted out their situation. They certainly acted up. In fact, when you think of Moses, you have to say this scenario depicted his finest hour. In fact, no scene depicts the necessity for a gap to be bridged than there at the camp at the foot of Mount Sinai. You see, under the direction of Moses, the people had come from Egypt to Mount Sinai where God was to give them the law. In fact, the Bible says that God descended upon the mountains in the midst of smoke and fire it was such an awesome sight. And the Israelites, along with Moses, were frightened at this manifestation of God Almighty. Moses, the leader of this people, spent 40 days upon the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. And as the hours turned into days, and the days turned into weeks, and the, the people who were left in the valley overcame their awe, and they became impatient. They asked, where is this man, Moses? Where is the one who brought us out of Egypt? We do not know what has become of him. And before long, they entered into a base and degenerate form of idol worship, worshiping the golden calf, in fact, separating themselves from the living God. They even declared in Exodus 32 verse 4, after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, these 
be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Imagine how terrible the separation of the children of Israel. I imagine how horrible the situation for whilst God had just given Moses the Ten Commandments, in fact, whilst God was in the very act of giving Moses the Ten Commandments, the people were already breaking the Ten Commandments. Just to underline how gross things were, whilst God was highlighting Exodus 22 to 5, remember he says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The very practice that God forbade, the making and worshiping of idols was actually going on full scale even whilst God was communicating the commandment to Moses. And so here, what took place was the age-old problem of self. Our leader has disappeared. We can no longer trust his leadership. Out of sight means out of mind. We can't just stop here and do nothing. We need to do something for ourselves. Self always creeps in. Self always creates a gap. Self always separates. But friends, there is an interesting dialogue which takes place in Exodus 32, verses 7 to 11. Exodus 32, 7 to 11 the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtst out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? And friends, a strange conversation between God and Moses, uh, highlighting the gap which self and in turn, sin causes. <coughs> God says to Moses, these are your people, and you delivered them out of Egypt. Moses says to God, no, no, these are your people, and you brought them out of Egypt almost like a father and mother whose child has fallen into trouble. And the father says, well, don't you think you should do something about your son? And his wife says, well, what do you mean my son? What are you going to do about your son? Neither wants to claim him in his present state. And in the same way, neither Moses nor the Lord seem to want to acknowledge ownership 
of the Israelites in the depraved and sinful condition. And so in Exodus 32 verse 14, we see that God is vexed, for the Bible says, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Moses dealt with the children of Israel. He even executed the leaders and called the people into repentance. Poor Moses was in a dreadful situation for he stood there in a special relationship to his people. But at the same time, he stood there in a special relationship to the Almighty God. And God still was angry as he awaited Moses' return upon the mountain. Now remember, remember upon the mountain, Moses had said to God, these are your people. And remember, a severe separation had been caused, a dreadful gap between the children of Israel and the living God. And as Moses had time to reflect, he realized more and more that these offensive people, these idolatrous people, these people who was classified as a stiff naked people, they were his people and he loved them. You know, it's hard, but brethren, even though a gap has come between you, you have to love people. Even though the sin is so repulsive and abhorrent, Moses shows us that you have to love people. And so Moses ponders over the offense his people have caused the living God. He acknowledges that sin, it just widens the gap between the savior and the sinner. He recognizes that something has to be done for the sinner. And his heart is pained. He knows how much God has been offended. And he considers his position as he stands there before God and also the people. I mean, what a position to be in. He weighs up the gap that has been wrought between God and man. And his heart is pain. And so with laboring footsteps, he drags his way up to the top of the mountain. With a burdened heart, he humbles himself in the presence of God and he mumbles a strange cry, a deep heartfelt prayer, knowing what was at stake. I don't know if I could have prayed like this. Knowing the cost, I don't know if I could have really lifted up this petition to God. For anyone who dares to bridge the gap of separation, this is an example of all examples. Moses cries out before God. Exodus 32, 31 to 32. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Friends, understand the anguish. Understand the pain. This is what bridging the gap of separation is all about. Those that study the construction of language tell us that when Moses says, yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, they say that this sentence is uneven and it just breaks off. Moses struggles to get his words out. Moses cries from the bottom of his heart, yet now, 
if thou wilt forgive their sin. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. It is only when you understand what Moses was saying here that you truly understand what bridging the gap of separation is all about. Uh, human beings have given their physical lives for others. But Moses was willing to exchange his eternal life for a people who to all appearances had no future. He pleaded for a people who griped and complained, a people who had no time for him. He threw his eternal life in the balance for this stiff-necked people in order to bridge the gap of separation between an ungrateful, uh, self-centered, sinful people and the Almighty God, Moses was willing to go to hell. The love of this man, Moses, for this stiff-necked people, it was so deep. Imagine he had seen the grave of sin of this people. They'd already rebelled against his leadership, and the truth is they would do so again. In fact, they would forever rebel against God, but still Moses loved them. And so he cries out, Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. I wonder how many under the sound of my voice would be willing to utter such a prayer on behalf of their brother or their sister in order that the gap of separation might be bridged. Not many would go that far. But the truth of the matter is that that is what bridging the gap is all about. Not many would go that far. But today I'm so glad that there was one who was willing to die in my stead that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to forgive. They were nailed to the cross. They were nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross and carried my sins with him there. Let me ask Rodney King's question once again, can we all get along? If my Jesus went to the cross to bridge the gap of separation, can we all get along? A little six-year-old girl became deadly ill with a terrible disease. She needed a special blood transfusion. She had a rare blood type, which made this a complicated affair. Uh, the girl's nine-year-old brother qualified as a blood donor, but everyone was hesitant to ask him as he was so young. Eventually, there was no option but to ask him. And so they talked to uh, the boy about the situation, and even though he did not fully understand all the dynamics, he responded, sure, I'll give my blood for my sister. And the transfusion began. He uh, took the needle in his arm, closed his eyes, 
and lay silently on the bed. After the transfusion was completed, the doctors thanked the boy for saving his sister's life. And then the brave brother began to quietly cry. And he looked up at the doctors and he asked, Doctor, when do I die? It was then that the doctor understood the magnitude of what this boy had done and quickly assured him that he wouldn't die. He was amazed at the boy's courage and he asked, well, why were you willing to risk your life for your sister? And the boy's answer is one that depicts the whole concept of bridging the gap of separation. The boy said, because she is my sister and I love her. Friends, bridge the gap of separation. Friends, bridge the gap. Today I leave you with Jesus' words, love one another even as I have loved you. Amen. Amen.